Good afternoon, everybody. Uh, welcome to uh, the, uh, well, Happy New Year, first of all, <laughs> and welcome to the Community for Global Health Equity, um, uh, co-production of knowledge for Global Health Equity seminar series. It's, uh, my name is Kasia Cordas. I'm a co-director uh, of the community, and uh, it's a pleasure for me to welcome you here. Um, and to welcome our uh, two guests uh, today. To tell you a little bit about uh, the seminar series, uh, we started in September and have been exploring topics related to the co-production of knowledge. Um, and those topics include uh, understanding deeper what it means to co-produce knowledge and why it is important to both communities as well as uh, universities and how the involvement of uh, non-academic partners with their lived expertise um, in their communities and with the problems that they're, um, uh, they're defining themselves, um, what that uh, brings to um, uh, how that can facilitate um, uh, uptake of evidence in programming and policy. Uh, so um, throughout this series, we're exploring these, um, these topics and, um, and want to discover how co-produced knowledge can promote health equity for individuals as well as um, health systems, understand the importance um, of an, uh, integrity, rigor, and relevance in the co-production of knowledge, uh, learn how to develop and nurture recipro reciprocal relationships, as well as discuss barriers to engaging in the co-production of knowledge and how to dismantle them. So to help us do this today, um, we have uh, two wonderful guests and I will introduce them. Uh, they are uh, uh, Dr. Eli Mui and uh, 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 Alison Dehoney. Uh, uh, Dr. Mui comes uh, to us from Johns Hopkins Bloom Bloomberg School of Public Health. She is a transdisciplinary scholar who's dedicated to identifying uh, public health uh, solutions that build on community assets and strengths. And her uh, research focus is to advance health equity through the lens of planning for food systems, transportation, and community development. Uh, she is leading a team of researchers and practitioners in Kerala, India, through the Plan Refuge project. Um, it's a multi-country project in the Global South um, with the aim of mitigating food and health inequities among small-scale farmers um, experiencing urbanization and climate change pressures. And in the United States, she is evaluating the role of collective efficacy and collaborative governments, uh, governance models to drive policy and food systems change at the local level. Dr. Mui uh, grew up in Bakersfield, California. She holds a uh, bachelor's degree in public health sciences and an MPH in health policy from Yale University. Um, and she uh, served as a marketing and communications officer, officer for the National Collaborative on Childhood Obesity Research in Washington, DC, before receiving her PhD in human nutrition from the Johns Hopkins Bloomberg School of Public Health. Following her doctoral training, uh, she completed a two-year postdoctoral fellowship with um, a commu the Community for Global Health Equity. So um, we're very happy to welcome her um, home. Uh, I, it is also my pleasure to introduce Alison Dehoney. Uh, she has two years of professional service in key areas of executive leadership, project management, and business development. So Ms. Dehoney is Executive Director of Urban Fruits and Veggies, LLC, um, and a nonprofit, um, Buffalo Go Green um, Incorporated, uh, which is an urban agriculture organization uh, that has been in operation since 2014. UFG um, uh, BGG uh, have an urban farm and mobile pro produce market that service food uh, desert areas and underserved communities. Um, Buffalo Go Green provides access to healthy fruits and vegetables and nutrition education. They sell at local farmers markets uh, weekly from June to October and operate a corporate wellness division where they embed their service, um, services into local companies and universities, corporate wellness programs, and offer programming for elementary and high school students where they teach nutrition um, education and farming. 
Prior to running these two entities, Ms. Dehoney worked as an account um, executive for three companies, growing books of businesses and developing, maintaining um, client relations. And um, she opened and ran an all-state insurance agency and a collection and finance um, agency. Ms. Dehoney holds a bachelor's degree in business administration and a master's degree in business management from um, Dai College. And she um, is currently a graduate candidate um, in certified plant-based uh, chef and cul culinary RX from um, um, Brooksby <laughs> Cooking School. Um, and I believe she actually completed that program in uh, December of 2020. So no longer a candidate, um, but actually a graduate. So um, it is my pleasure uh, to welcome both of you. I'm looking forward to your presentation and um, your conversation and please take it away. Oh, and also, I'm sorry, just to the, um, to the audience, uh, as you will see, we have um, a chat box available for you. So please feel free to type in uh, your thoughts as, um, as our speakers are um, presenting. And we all will also have a Q&A session at the end. And you're welcome to type in your questions to, um, in that format as well. So um, welcome. Thank you, Kasha, for the introductions. Um, thank you to you and Samina for the opportunity to be a part of this panel and to just for helping to organize us this afternoon. I'm really, really excited and honored to be sharing the Zoom stage, if you will, with Allison today. Um, and the focus of our talk will be on bridging community university networks, the hidden impacts of partnership and co-production in food systems planning scholarship and action. First, we'd like to acknowledge uh, several organizations listed here who have provided support and made the work that we'll be talking about today possible. Just as a brief overview of our talk, Allison and I will start by sharing our background stories and motivation for our work in food systems planning and promoting food security and healthy eating. We'll then share the beginnings of our partnership followed by our efforts and plans in working toward sustainable co-production. Then we'll close with some key takeaways on developing and nurturing co-production um, and mutually beneficial partnerships. I'll just add that as a junior faculty myself, uh, my hope, and I think it's safe to say, our hope is that sharing how, how our budding partnership came to be might offer some ideas or useful insights for other researchers or community partners who may be less familiar with co-production or interested in engaging in co-production. So with that, I will hand it over to Allison. Oh, Allison, I think you're on mute. So sorry. <laughs> thank you, Eli. No and thank you, Kasha, thank you. Jessica, and Samina for um, helping us to bring this information um, and be a part of this uh, series of, of presentations. So I'll start way back in the beginning. Um, here's just a series of pictures that kind of outline my um, background. The first picture is a beautiful picture of the island of Trinidad and Tobago, and that is where my mother is from. Um, next, there is a map of uh, uh, downstate New York. This, these tiny little towns and villages are located about 60 miles outside of New York City. Um, there's a village named Warwick, which is where my father um, was born. I was also born there. So um, my mother left Trinidad to go to nursing school in England, and my father left Warwick to join the Air Force and was stationed in England, and that's where they met and um, eventually moved back to the United States. Um, we see our planes there representing the Air Force. Um, we were an Air Force family. We moved around. There's a picture of um, Plattsburgh, New York, uh, the capital, um, the um, the seat, the state seat for um, Boston, Massachusetts. Um, there's a picture of Okinawa, Japan. Um, there's uh, the star of the state of Texas, 
and as you can see, Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. So just some of the places that we lived. Um, eventually um, resided in Buffalo. Uh, I graduated with an MBA and started a career in commercial insurance. Um, that career spanned about um, 20 years and uh, I was definitely interested in making a change. So I was speaking with some um, city leaders and talking about food insecurity and um, food deserts in uh, the Buffalo area and started to do some research about both of those two issues that are prevalent in our community and decided that um, that would be where I would begin to make my career change. Uh, next slide, please. So before any of this, before me and my mother and my father, there was a gentleman named Moses Piggery, who was my great, great um, uncle. And he uh, served as a Union soldier in um, the colored infantry during the Civil War. And then when he completed his military service, he purchased some land and became a truck farmer and grew vegetables for market. So um, I still try to uh, square that in my head that he actually did that all those years ago. And he and I share the same birth month and birthday. Next slide, please. So a bit of the history of um, urban fruits and veggies in Buffalo Go Green. Um, after spending a lot of time in um, a corporate setting and doing my research about um, again, food insecurity and food deserts. And I put the word food deserts here because that is what the research um, that I was doing uh, talked about. But as we um, really start to do this work, we, at, those of us in the food space ask that we change that term to food apartheid. Um, a food desert implies that it's a natural state of, of being on um, our earth's surface. And there's nothing natural about um, the situation of food insecurity and lack of access to fresh fruits and vegetables. So we in this uh, food space and who do this work ask that we start to use the word, um, the, the term food apartheid. So um, the company and the organization were founded in 2014. We started with our urban farm, our mobile produce market. And at this time, we did not have any partners. Next slide, please. And these are just some pictures of um, what our property looked like um, as we were beginning to um, build our farm. So we were fortunate enough to have lots of students and lots of schools come and help us um, build the farm. Uh, there's a picture of the contractor that we work with who continues to work with us to this day. It would be difficult to do what we do without them. Next slide. And this is uh, just a picture of our um, mobile, mobile produce market, um, our farmer's market, and um, our urban farm as it looks today. Next slide, please. So um, although we're growers and distributors, our main focus is on wellness. And it's on wellness because it is <clears throat> such a serious issue in the communities that we serve. And so we work uh, diligently daily to try to make the correlation between how your food is grown, where you purchase your food, the quality of your food, and its direct impact on um, one's health, which is a message that is um, not always given. And if it is given, it's not given in a way that um, is receptive to some of the communities who struggle most with this issue. So here we, we are part of um, the mayor's summer city fitness program with Blue Cross and Blue Shield. And um, the other pictures are a picture of our corporate one of our fruits and vegetables prescription program that we partner with the community health centers of Buffalo. 
And we um, run this program, we've run this program every year for the last four years. And what we do is we um, start the year off with a wellness event and some cooking demonstrations that are interactive and folks are able to take home with them everything that is demoed um, in, uh, at that event. Next slide, please. So this work um, has uh, called for uh, me to be in several other spaces besides um, the daily activity of running the business and organization. So I'm currently the chair of the Buffalo and Erie County Food Policy Council. I'm a founding member of Black Farmers United New York State. Um, that coalition works to find other um, farmers of color uh, and to um, find out the needs and work to um, provide solutions for those needs. Um, I'm also part of Black Farmer Fund Pilot Community, and this um, community uh, was created because of the um, continued uh, lack of access to capital by Black farmers and Black um, food systems business owners. Uh, so we're creating a program and a system where those that are deserving but do not meet society's definition of what deserving of capital investment and grant funding means. And we're creating a way to support those businesses and farms um, with funding and grants. In addition to that, I'm a board member of the Erie County Farm Bureau. Next slide, please. So looking to the future, and we'll talk more about this um, as the presentation moves on, um, and why um, Eli, how Eli and I came to work together through the Community Food Systems Grant. Um, this looking to our future, that grant um, was instrumental in us being able to develop this future and to have this um, as part of the large vision for the organization. And we'll talk more about that as the um, presentation goes on. And I will turn it over to Eli. Thanks, Allison. So I'll just share a little bit um, about my background story and motivation for doing research on food. And on the left side of your screen, I'm sharing a photo of my mother and father in Oklahoma, where they met in the early 1980s. My father emigrated from Hong Kong soon after the Vietnam War, and my mother emigrated around the same time from South Korea. From Oklahoma, my parents eventually moved to my hometown of Bakersfield, California, where I grew up as the eldest of three kids. Bakersfield, um, for those of you who are not familiar, has a population of about 830,000 people in the larger metro area. And let's just say it's not usually a go-to destination like its neighboring city of Los Angeles, which is just a couple hours south of Bakersfield. But Bakersfield is a significant hub in the country for both agriculture and energy production. And photographed on the right shows something I commonly encountered, um, which is this interesting juxtaposition of oil wells in the middle of farmland. Now in the 80s and into the 90s, it, it was not common for me to really find many other kids who looked like me or came from a family similar to mine. And, I remember quite vividly as a child struggling to find where I felt like I belonged. And as I worked through these tensions um, between my American identity and my Asian identity, at home I often felt I was too American, uh, but outside of home amongst my peers, I was made to feel too Asian or, or not American enough. So I share that just to say that this feeling of being misplaced or not quite belonging in any one space really urged me to reflect on my own position in this world, beginning from an early age, whether as an Asian American woman or female professional. And I believe these lived experiences have really prepared me for the research I do today. Now, why work on food? Uh, in addition to the public health benefits of healthy eating, of course, one thing that has always helped to keep me grounded was gathering around the table to share a meal. And food has really been a way for me to connect my history and my story with my present. 
On the left um, is a photo of my paternal great great grandfather's home in a village in the southeast part of China, where I had the chance to visit about five years ago. And I was pleasantly surprised to find that it was surrounded by a vast plain of paddy fields. And similarly, um, my maternal and paternal grandparents were in the food and restaurant business. And on the right, is my maternal grandmother in South Korea in front of her restaurant of over 30 years. So today food continues to serve as a thread in my public health work that is really motivated by wanting to understand others position in this world to question whose health and lives are at stake and to do my part in helping to lift up voices that have been minimized or excluded. Now, I will say that I think the intensity and degree to which researchers work with community partners can cover the spectrum from community engagement to community-based participatory research to co-production. And over time, I've tried to work toward co-production. For me, meaning community partners have greater control and ownership of the research process. On this slide, I'm sharing just some photographs of my work over the last 10 years. Um, earlier in my career in New Haven, I worked with residents to um, administer a community health assessment of the six lowest income neighborhoods through a group called the Community Alliance for Research and Engagement. And during my doctoral training in Baltimore at the uh, Bloomberg School of Public Health, I convened a workshop to co-create a conceptual map of the neighborhood food system and to together identify strategies to overcome barriers to healthy food access. And more recently, um, as Kasha mentioned, I had the opportunity to work with colleagues at CGHE and the UB Food Lab to lead some work in Kerala, India, where we centered our project on advancing the well-being of smallholder farmers who remain at odds with the globalizing food system, urbanization, and climate change. So that uh, wraps up the first part of, of, of our talk and offers a little bit of both mine and Allison's background and motivations. And in terms of the beginnings of our partnership, I think um, both Allison and I share parallels and also complementary experiences that have prepared us with some shared values um, and a certain level of readiness that you'll hear as a, a repeated theme throughout our presentation today. And these shared values, I think, that have really enabled us to work together on issues of food equity. So as uh, mentioned, after completing my doctoral training, I was fortunate to join CGHC in the UB Food Lab as a postdoc fellow. And um, in this position, I had the pleasure of meeting Allison uh, in the context of the Community Food Systems Project. Um, this grant program was developed by United Way of Buffalo in Erie County in 2017 to implement strategies that would promote food equity in the city of Buffalo and the greater Buffalo area. So you, the UB Food Lab, where I held my position, served as the local evaluation partner, working closely with United Way and the project grantees to inform the design of the program, monitor the, monitor the program as it unfolded in the Buffalo region, and to evaluate its successes as well as its challenges. And one of the grantees was Buffalo Go Green, which we um, just heard Allison talk, to, talk about, which is the nonprofit arm of Allison's Urban Fruits and Veggies. Now, because this was one of my first projects in Buffalo, for me, this was an opportunity to really listen, learn, and begin to build relationships with various organizations working in Buffalo system, Buffalo's food system. And at the bottom of the slide um, are uh, the project goals of this project, which were to foster collaborations within the food security network in the community, improve access to healthy foods, create food related job opportunities, promote food entrepreneurships uh, such as business incubators or community kitchens, strengthen food skills and establish food policy that supports uh, that would support the above efforts or similar initiatives. 
So with these goals in mind, United Way of Buffalo and Erie County invited organizations to submit full applications to support work on promoting food equity and following a multi-stage review process selected the 13 organizations um, shown in the red bubbles. Uh, and these organizations were charged to implement a series of projects over a two year period. Just to clarify, this is a very, very simplified version of a social network diagram and does not include all of the networks related to the community food systems project. But I included it to begin to illustrate not only how Allison and I are connected, but I think in terms of the impact of our work, I found it important to really understand how I fit into these broader social networks that existed long before I had arrived. And I think our shared values in these histories and understanding each other's position in the community food system has really better positioned us for success in our partnership. And so from the, the research and evaluation perspective, um, I'll just share a bit about the impact of this two year community food system project. Um, during the grant period, uh, over 14,000 pounds of food were grown in community gardens, farms, and private gardens. And funding from this project also allowed grantees to scale up aggregation and food retail distribution. In terms of food skills training, this reached over 20,000 unique individuals across Buffalo who received training from food production, food shopping, food preservation, food, food safety, and reducing food waste. Uh, a little over 200 individuals received training in employment and entrepreneurship activities tied to food production, food aggregation and wholesale, food retail and food service. And finally, thanks in part to the Community Food Systems Project, the Food Policy Council of Buffalo and Erie County drafted a food action plan which Allison will talk about in greater detail next. So with that, I'll hand it um, over to you, Allison. Thank you, Eli. And I'll just continue to talk about um, the impact of this community food systems project. But first, I think it's important to um, just draw everyone's attention to those um, the goals of the project and how well thought out those goals were and how relevant they were to the community in which these funds were gonna go directly to. And I feel like that's such an important thing to point out if um, folks are considering co-production. So um, this was Buffalo Go Green's first major grant. And um, anyone who's aware of how grant funding works with not-for-profits, it's very difficult to um, get your initial funding because a lot of organizations don't want to be the first one in for fear that the organization will not be successful. So that's the first very important point. Um, and again, this grant was the only and remains the only grant that the Food Policy Council in Buffalo and Erie County has ever received. Um, until that time, it was very difficult to do the work. It was very difficult to um, have dedicated and committed um, council members uh, participate on a consistent basis. And, a, and having an influx of funds to um, focus on a strategic plan and a food action plan gave um, the council members some direction, something to focus on and say, this is what we're working on and um, it's worth my time and it's worth my dedication to um, focus and see these two plans through. Um, so what this uh, initial funding has done for our organization is it positioned us to purchase additional um, prior vacant city lots. So in order to um, go to the city, at least in 
the way our municipality is set up, you have to have a plan. You have to, they're not just going to sell you tracts of land. Um, even if you have the money, there has to be a well thought out plan that shows some um, funds available to implement your plan. So having the funding from this grant allowed us to um, put a plan together for what we wanted that space to look like. And then we could say to the city, we have X number of dollars to do X and we're gonna continue to fundraise to do Y. In addition to um, funding, what uh, this um, receiving this grant did what was it opened up an entire network of food systems actors in our community. It allowed us to, we had lunches, we had dinners, we had um, skill shares, we had meetings, and it allowed us to develop relationships organically. Um, we just didn't start working together because we received the grant. We started working together because we kept seeing each other. We kept interacting with each other. With each other. We kept learning about each other's organization values, goals, and directions, and it allowed us to determine whether or not any of those three things aligned and how we could move forward together. Next slide. So in addition to those kind of maybe obvious or understandable um, um, outcomes of this project, there are some hidden impacts. And again, to talk about the Food Policy Council, when we um, finally got to the time when we started to work on our food action plan, we wanted to make sure that we weren't missing anything, that we were seeing um, the community in which this food action plan was eventually going to serve. Um, we, we, made sure, we wanted to make sure we didn't miss anything. So we called on the UB Food Lab to take a look at the plan and um, help us fill in any gaps. Um, in addition, community partners benefit from the strength and reputation of universities. And the hope there is, is that um, positive outcomes from co-production will help department chairs and university leaders encourage co-production research and work. Uh, when funding opportunities arise, um, the strong relationships are already in place and requests um, for participation in those projects and grant submissions are bi-directional. This is a shared benefit for the university and the community-based organizations. Um, and lastly, one of the hidden impacts that came out of this is a current project that um, uh, uh, I'm working with with Eli and um, the Buffalo, uh, the UB Food Lab and some other community partners. Um, the outcomes of the fruits and vegetables prescription program have been able to have um, influences on some of the directions that our, our current project growing food policy from the ground up needed. And um, we were able to impact some of that direction with our current work and past um, data from that work. And I'll turn it, um, let's see, back over to Eli. Thanks, Allison. So um, in the last part we've, or in this last part, excuse me, we'll talk about how we've continued to build on um, the community food systems project toward further nurturing sustainable co-production. And the community food system project, as you've heard, was foundational, I think, in introducing me to Allison and to the Buffalo community, which enabled both of us to learn more about the Buffalo context in different ways, which ultimately strengthened our readiness and capacity to engage in co-production on this next project um, called Growing Food Policy from the Ground Up. So Allison and I took some of these lessons learned um, to this project along and are working along with other collaborators, which you can now see in the green bubbles, um, including the food, the UB Food Lab, the Johns Hopkins Bloomberg School of Public Health, the University of Minnesota, and with community partners in both cities, including the Massachusetts Avenue Project, Urban Fruits and Veggies, and Appetite for Change. 
So for this project, I'm serving in the role as a co-I leading one arm of the project and I've been working closely with Allison and other community partners throughout the entirety of the research process from proposal writing to project planning to gearing up for recruitment and data collection where we are now. So just to share a little bit more about the goals of this work and to give you a sense for how this is building on our previous work, this is a five year project um, that is that aims to generate capacity building lessons for local governments by drawing on lessons from both Buffalo and Minneapolis. Uh, first goal is to examine social networks in urban food systems and their role in facilitating um, food systems level change. The second goal is to identify limitations between urban food systems and local government policy networks, especially those impacting urban growers of color. And the third goal, which should be in green actually, excuse that. Um, uh, to, is to develop methods and engaging urban growers to emerge as leader in local policy networks. So to reinforce the importance of readiness and shared values that Alice and I have touched on and to further nurture our reciprocal partnerships, our team members of faculty, students, and community partners discussed our shared values, hopes, as well as anticipated challenges for this project. And he pictured here is a word cloud of um, some of the, the values that came out of this discussion. And so we bring these shared values to our research. Um, and at this point, I'd like to invite Allison to talk about, um, from her perspective, how these shared values have been brought to bear. Back over to you, Allison. Thank you, Eli. So yes, the shared values um, that we find regarding transparency and all documents being on Google Docs and um, just in the way that we communicate um, from the smallest things such as time and making sure that everyone's time is valued and everyone is involved in when we schedule and um, what's going to be discussed. So there's a mutual respect and um, the respect by the community based organizations for the knowledge and structure and procedures that academics bring into the community when partnering is mutual um, by um, academics and the university and specifically in this in this project. Um, um, our knowledge, education, um, skills, and expertise, and um, relationships in the community are respected equally. Next slide, please. Um, so for this, for our particular project that we're speaking of now, um, co-producing before the inception of the project. So um, all community partners and university um, folks were involved in the proposal writing. Um, determining which community partners aligned with this project, project planning, communication, um, and again, allowing for the work of community partners to influence what some of the outcome, some of the desired outcomes could be for this project and its impact in the community. Next slide. So again, um, co-production, oh, this is, um, this is you, Eli, back to you. <laughs> <laughs> no worries. Um, so I'll just continue to build on um, what Allison has shared and detail a little bit more um, what co-production has looked like in the research process um, from the academic standpoint. And so, as I mentioned, I am, leading the, the household survey as part of this project. And the household survey is focusing on measuring different metrics of community health and collective agency. And so the entirety of the team, we hold regular team meetings with our community partners. And Allison is one of a group of community partners on this project. And for the household survey, we've worked closely on co-developing the household survey. Um, checking in with our community partners in terms of questions around food security and social networks and what makes sense in this context. And we've also talked about with our community partners, 
pilot testing the household survey, what administration of the household survey should look like, considerations around respondent burden, and also planning for recruitment. And in terms of the more outward facing components of the project, um, a research faculty at Hopkins, Nina Martin, who also specializes in communication, is working with a local artist in Buffalo, Adris, um, at Eat Off Art, to work on co-designing also the communication materials related to the project, including the website and social media. So we're really thinking about all in the entirety of the research process, really making it a co-production. And um, this brings me to my last point regarding technology, which Allison talked about, and our use of Google Docs and Google Drive, I think has really helped to facilitate transparency in our co-production. And I, I found it very helpful to utilize this platform um, that enables everybody access to research meeting agendas, adding agenda items, access to previous meeting minutes, um, decisions that were made in those meetings, planning documents, et cetera. And so hopefully um, that helps to give a little bit of a sense of what the co-production research process has looked like in the case of this project. So in closing, um, we wanted to transition and wrap up with just a few key insights uh, on developing mutually beneficial partnerships. And the first being that co-production requires readiness both on the part of researchers and community partners. On the end of the researcher, I think readiness can come from lived experience. I talked about how my upbringing and experiences with feeling misplaced or excluded, put how that pushed me to evaluate my position and the position of others in different spaces. But equally, equally important, I think, is to have the training to co-produce in research. I know I have certainly benefited from having Samina as a mentor and the opportunity to watch, to really learn and engage with partners in Buffalo during my postdoc training. Uh, that's enabled me to continue to build on these relationships with Allison and other partners in Buffalo. In fact, to give a very specific example, on day one of my postdoc, I participated in a training workshop on race and class that was facilitated by an external organization and involved both research members from the food lab as well as community partners. Allison, did you want to add anything else to um, the, the readiness part and right fit in terms of partnership? So I guess I'd just like to share that um, sometimes uh, shared value, sometimes values do not align and sometimes readiness is not evident and that that needs to be okay. And that it's important to make sure that partnerships um, align in value in order to move forward on these projects that sometimes take on a life of their own. And you're gonna need that strong foundation of knowing that you have shared values when things kind of get a little hectic and everybody's um, grounded in the work. So I think it's important to um, sometimes say, you know, this is not a good partnership and we need to find, you know, work elsewhere to, to find those partners that work together. So um, one thing, one of the things that I'd like to just touch on, and I know we're getting close on time, um, but I wanted to talk about the process and how important um, research is and, and, and for researchers and universities not to um, minimize in any way the value of research, both positive and negative. And I'd like to just um, draw your attention to Harriet Washington's book um, entitled Medical Apartheid. And in her book, she examines the brutal history of medical experimentation on slaves. And she also goes into talking about how medical doctors and researchers participated and um, uh, were able to bring uh, justification to some of the brutality that took place. Um, and I'll just give you a few examples. Um, there were several doctors wrote their thesis papers on um, 
on uh, the brutality and um, they wrote papers on fraudulent illnesses of slaves. Um, there was a time when um, whipping slaves became uh, a form of medicine for malingering slaves. And there, there are just so many examples in this book of how research was able to um, justify some of the brutality that slaves endured um, because they were able to say scholars have studied this and they've written papers and so um, we must be correct in our actions. So I say all that to say that um, when a community isn't involved in a strategic and um, proper way, um, uh, putting out research can can sometimes be um, harmful to communities where um, harm wasn't the intention. So I just caution as researchers to be cognizant of that. And then finally, um, that leads us to the last takeaway number three, with inclusive processes, um, co-production can enhance both the visible and the more hidden impacts of research. And in the Community Food System Project, for example, um, in my view, partnership and co-production really facilitated bi-directional learning in terms of developing an evaluation that would be useful for United Way and the 13 participating grantees as well as building the capacity of participating organizations to engage with other actors in the community food system, which we heard Allison talk about. And ultimately in the end, I think the reach and impact of this work went beyond the scope of the project. Um, for example, with regard to the food action plan. And then the last note I'd make is that um, I think co-producing knowledge across the academic research and community life boundaries can really enable researchers to reframe the problem question, which can then lead to different kinds of solutions. For example, if a researcher enters a community with a more deficit-based framework, for example, a neighborhood is lacking healthy foods, um, or a community has low demand for healthy foods, I think this lends itself to a very different way of engaging with the community and can lead to identifying solutions for a community. Whereas in co-production, researchers are more likely to apply an asset-based framework and solutions are more likely to be identified with community partners. Um, and with that, I, I wanted to also hand it back to Allison, which I think uh, has some closing remarks for us. Yeah, so along the lines of um, speaking about uh, um, some of the challenges or some of the negative impacts that research can have on communities. Um, and folks might say, well, um, uh, Harriet Washington's book uh, examined a time that was such a so long ago. So um, we can, you know, think of the really um, documented um, things that happen such as, you know, the tremendous amount of experimentation on black women, um, Henrietta Lacks and the Tuskegee experiment. But I wanted to try to um, get some experience uh, separate from mine in my community and closer in time. So I spoke with um, a very respected community member in um, the city of Buffalo who's been working on food systems for a long time now to just find out um, what her experience has been with universities um, working with the community. And her, um, her recollection of, of her first site of colleges and universities in the community was when um, they started recruiting uh, black and brown folks who were um, going to be able to receive funding from the state and federal actually go to school. So um, again, it was not the ideal situation of the universities and colleges working in communities. So um, I show that progression to say that I feel like I am very fortunate because my um, experience working with colleges and universities has been about 98% positive. And why has that been? Because my very first experience 
um, working with the University of Buffalo um, in this food space was with UB for Food Lab and Dr. Samina Raja and her all the team at the Food Lab. Extremely positive experience. Working with the Masters in Public Health Department um, and the Veggie Van Study, extremely positive experience. Working with Cornell Cooperative Extension and their Small Farms Program, very, um, very positive experience. So I'm hoping that um, this co-production model and partnering um, with uh, community partners that um, have shared values and um, where readiness is evident is gonna be a model and set the stage for how we work together in the future to serve um, the same communities that we want to help in, in an impactful way. Thanks, Allison. And I think on that note- um, Thank you, Eli. <laughs> <laughs> we can open it up for Q and A. Okay. Thank you, both of you. Um, this is Samina Raja. It's a pleasure to listen to both of you. And I am monitoring the chat and questions and answers. We'll give people a couple of uh, minutes to ask. And then I have some questions for both of you. The first question has rolled in from um, Dr. Claire Cameron, uh, who's a colleague here at UB, and she is thanking both of you and asking um, as follows. I'm curious if an assessment tool for faculty members readiness for co-production could be useful. Uh, I'm reading out the questions in the event that somebody has dialed in using only their phone and are unable to see the chat. Thank you for the question, um, Claire. So I'll turn it over to both of you, either of you um, who would like to address Claire's question. Um, I'll start, but Eli, please um, join, join me. I think um, that uh, an assessment would be great, especially if um, there are departments that don't have a lot of experience. Um, the one thing I would caution is that an assessment tool is great, but there has to be um, the desire and the understanding of the community from the folks in that department. Um, it's, it's not easy to get community buy-in um, if the community doesn't know you. So that I think would be um, something to take into consideration, even if you had the assessment today. Yeah, I would agree with that. Um, and to build on that, say that the readiness of the faculty needs to be there. And as Allison talked about in the community, but I think in thinking about the assessment tool itself, that itself should be something that is a result of co-production too. Can you say more about that latter part, Eli? I think that um, it's easy to fall into the habit, I think, of developing an assessment tool to for evaluation purposes, but the metrics that are used and what is proper readiness for co-production, there should be input from both faculty and community partners in developing that tool. Thank you. I'll raise the next question. Uh, in the meantime, I invite participants on the call and we have quite a few to drop in their questions. Um, I was really struck by both of your journeys uh, separately and then that how it intertwined in Buffalo. Um, Eli, you talked quite a bit about your training, which was very much in public health uh, doing quite a bit of work on behavior, nutrition, diet, and then looking to broaden your training into the systemic change. And in some ways, Allison, I hear the same threads in your comment too. The initial um, work on food deserts, on diets, and then working on policy. Um, so I'm wondering uh, what you might say to uh, first, I'm going to pose question to Eli. I'm wondering what you might say, Eli, to faculty and 
and researchers in the traditional field of public health about why uh, you chose both of those facets. You've certainly not given up on thinking about diet change and individual behavior, but you have supplemented it. Uh, why is that important? Um, and then it's the same question that I have for Allison. What, say more about what prompted you to shift from thinking not just about say food deserts to thinking about food apartheid. That's a pretty fantastic example. Um, I didn't set you up to say that, but that I think um, is a great example. So from a research point of view, why food apartheid, not food desert, Eli? And Allison, same for you. So for me, um, I think I chose to make that shift because I realized that food behaviors don't happen in a silo. Um, there are, and you know, in public health, we are talking much more now about social determinants of health and really understanding the interconnection between systems. And I think those systems are also not by accident. Those systems are by design. So it's really important to, um, if we in public health are trying to affect behavior change, have to understand who designed those systems and how those decisions were made and ensure that those who were excluded from those decision-making processes have a seat at the table in reshaping the food system and the other systems that are connected to it. Hmm. So I guess for myself, um, and I am included in that education process regarding food deserts and food apartheid, because as I stated initially, when I was doing my research several years ago, there was never any mention of food apartheid. It was all about food deserts. And so what happens a lot in communities that are economically depressed and in communities of color is that we get these labels and we take them and we do not question them. We just say, oh, I live in a food desert without um, taking time to say, but a food desert is a, a, a part of our earth. It's a, it's a natural, um, like we have oceans and rivers and lakes, we have deserts and, and it, it fits in with our ecosystem the way it should. So I don't live in a place like that. I live in a place where um, folks purposely do not build grocery stores. I live in a place where if you do not have a vehicle, you are going to struggle to um, put groceries on the table for you and your family. And like Eli said, that is by design. So it's important, um, and this is also where universities and colleges can be of great assistance to help communities understand that education process and explain and give um, data and research as to why you do not live in a food desert. You live in a food apartheid, either zip code or neighborhood or area. And I think the more that we um, co-produce and work together, it opens up for communities to be able to question and they have a safe place to go to say, I was thinking about this or I heard about this, can you help me with this? Thank you, very insightful. We have a question from Dr. Cordes, who's a colleague um, that both of you know. She's thanking you for your experiences and sharing experiences and lessons openly. Um, she notes that there are many partners in your network, which is a great asset. She wonders if you could talk about how you all keep track of the potentially changing needs and priorities within this large network and make sure that the work moves forward. So um, you can, either one of you can take a stab at that. I'll start, Eli, if you don't mind. Yeah, go for um, it, please. Allison. It's a great question. It's very overwhelming. And when I think about it, honestly, if I knew that um, this was as big an undertaking as it is, I probably would never have done it. <laughs> um, <laughs> So um, it's difficult. However, 
Um, what's rising to the surface and what is really great is that while we're all functioning in this food, food space, for example, um, African uh, Heritage Co-op, they do, while our work is connected, they do a few things and they do them specifically and they do them well. Um, uh, um, grassroots gardens, yes, our work is connected, but they do a few things specifically and they do them well. And so what's happening, which I think is an amazing thing, and it's just so good for everyone, is we're starting to lean on each other for those um, areas that each organization has a great skill set and has seemed to have um, mastered uh, whatever it is that we need for our partnerships. And we're coming together and we're trying to solve our collective problems in our, in our community together by um, partnering this way. But yes, it is difficult to keep track of it. And um, I can't say that there's one, any one entity keeping track, but somehow um, we know who to call when we need a skill set or a person or, or whatever it is we're looking for to serve the community. Yeah, on my end, I'll be quite honest, I, I haven't quite figured it out from my from the research standpoint. Um, but what I can say that is that I think that the network is our strength. And like Allison said, the more that we strengthen and build on these relationships, we're able to lean on each, each other's strengths. And um, I've really been fortunate in continuing to work with this group and learn from the infrastructure that's slowly building so that if one person or another person in the network has to go focus attention somewhere else, there will be somebody else who can help with a given task. Um, so it is something that I'm still learning, but um, as, as Dr. Cordes points out, the, the greatest asset is the network and the strengths in the network. Thank you, Eli. Thank you, Allison. A question from Dr. Rajan, um, who's asking, since academics and community partners have different skills, expertise, and experiences, what challenges did you face in learning about the other partners approach? How much of an obstacle is this to co-production? I can take that, I can start there. Um, one of the things that I found challenging was um, the need to meet to gather data. And sometimes those questions seem repetitive. And as I have, um, broaden my work with academics and I understand greater um, the pockets of data that they may be focusing on and why that question is asked that way for that set of data. And then they ask the question again for another set of data in a different way. It now makes sense. But initially it is challenging and it's sometimes kind of like, well, we're gonna spend two whole hours talking about data. And so um, when you realize the benefit of it for your organization and how it can have a positive impact on your work and how it can narrow your focus, um, it becomes extremely valuable. So it's just, I think, getting a little bit over that initial, um, understanding of how researchers think and work? I think for me, one of the challenges has been around timing and um, the expectations of what goals researchers um, should be meeting versus community partners and aligning the timing of those. Um, and so I think in working towards overcoming that challenge, it's learning to find um, a common ground. And I think that's where the shared values really are valuable. If you and your community partners are working toward the shared goal, 
I think that it really facilitates more flexibility in the scheduling and the needs of the researcher as well as the community partner and making sure that the two are working together in a way that's mutually beneficial. And I think that has that's such a good point, Eli, because um, there has to be trust there. Like I have to trust that when you say, Allison, we need to schedule some time to do X, that it's relevant and important. And you're not just like kind of checking a box. Like your um, demand on my time is to get the outcome that we have agreed we both want. And again, that goes back to the shared values and the trust and the relationships. Thank you both. Um, I think you have just co-produced the next journal article, but we can talk about that later. <laughs> There's a question I believe that's um, been shared by Camille Brown, who's uh, the manager of the UB Food Lab, but she might also be uh, presenting it on behalf of other teammates. Um, they would like to hear from you how might co-production be a better research tool if one is interested in policy change? Um, I'll, I'll, I'll take a try at this, Allison, and then please chime in. Um, I think policy change is intended to serve the public and people at the end of the day. And research is often used to inform policy change. So the more that we are able to engage in co-production in the research process, I think it will add authenticity and, and add value to the research that will ultimately inform the policy that will affect communities that they're intended to serve. And I think we have a good example of that. And Samina, I hope you don't mind me sharing, but there's a team across the state that's working with um, the Commissioner of Agriculture to um, present some a plan to our governor to um, have a more diverse and inclusive um, agriculture industry. And you know whether folks agree or not, when um, the when you have a professor from the University of Buffalo supporting a large group of community based organizations looking to affect policy change, it strengthens um, it strengthens our ability to get the message across that we need this policy change, and um, so so we're we're grateful when we have that extra um, that extra amount of um, support to um, further and champion what we're trying to get across. Thank you. We have a question from our um, colleague at the Community for Global Health Equity, Jessica Skates. Um, she's asking, can you speak to what you call bi-directional learning? What methods have you employed or others have employed to ensure bi-directional learning has occurred and to ensure that what you are measuring as learned is relevant and important to both university and community partners? And I will disclose that um, Jessica is training in educational policy. So therefore that's likely where her <laughs> question is rooted. So say more about bi-directional learning, please. I think I was the one that used that term. So I will go ahead and uh, take that question. Um, in terms of bi-directional learning, the method that we've used, um, I think, for one, the transparency in our communication um, with our community partners and with our research team, just sharing what the research team is thinking and planning for, hearing from community partners and creating the space where community partners can push back on what our research plans are, whether it's around a survey tool or recruitment planning or what have you. Um, I think that's enabled this bi-directional 
uh, learning in some sense and that we can pivot and shift things in a way that is more relevant and meaningful for our community partners. Um, that was one approach that we'd used with the Community Food Systems Project and that working closely with United Way and with the 13 grantees and understanding what should be evaluated, what is um, successful work in promoting food equity. That was something that was bi-directional. And as we heard um, from Allison, as a result of that project also, there was capacity building and learning among the 13 organizations about net networks and relationships that could be developed across um, the 13 organizations and beyond with other actors in the food system. To the second question about to ensure what we're measuring is learned, um, I think that there's opportunity to really think more about what those specific metrics are, um, which I think circles back to one of our first questions in the discussion and how we're measuring successful co-production and co-learning. Um, that's definitely an area where I think there's a lot of opportunity for us to work together on. And specifically, one of the hidden um, impacts of, um, of our co-production was that um, when there's opportunity for um, new projects and grant funding, that the requests are um, bi-directional. Sometimes they um, are a request from a community partner, and sometimes it's a request from the university to participate and um, further uh, partner work together and co-produce. Thank you. I think Jessica has just given us an idea for a future research, co-produced research project. So this is great. Um, the next question is from Kristen Tallis. I hope I'm pronouncing your name correctly. Um, Kristen is from the Center for American Indian Health and has a question about how involved the native or indigenous tribes were in the process. Not sure which particular project um, Kristen is referring to, but um, either you could respond to that how you wish, please. So um, I can respond, uh, Eli, if you don't mind, on the Food Policy Council um, side. Uh, it was very important that while we unfortunately don't have um, a Native American person on our food council, food policy council, but we needed to recognize um, the Haudenosaunee land that we're on. We needed to recognize um, past indiscretions and discrimination and brutality um, on Native people, to Native peoples. And so um, even though we didn't have a person to represent that um, when you are, I feel like, you know, when you going back to Eli's um, uh, personal history, when you have experienced um, discrimination or not fitting in, sometimes, not always, but sometimes you are more cognizant to those situations, um, even if they don't directly impact you but you know that they existed and they're akin to some of what um, your ancestors or you know, people currently go through. So um, we need more of that, but we did try to acknowledge and recognize that in our food action plan, which is our public facing document. So not only did we recognize it on our council and talk about it, we wanted it in our public facing document. Eli, would you like to add? No, that was great. Thanks, Allison. I'm not 100% sure I answered the question directly, but I think that was um, the best that I way, way to respond. Thank you. I don't see additional questions filtering in, so I have a few that I was holding back. Um, which I would like to ask if it's okay. Um, 
Eli, you're at a particular juncture in your career, and we I'm looking at who is on the call right now. We have attendees who are faculty, and we have community partners from our network dialed in as well. Um, so for Eli, I'm wondering what advice you would give to um, early career faculty on um, how to step into co-production work while um, attending to the demands of the rigor of being on tenure track. Um, as faculty who are on tenure track are aware, there is a certain rubric, certain kinds of demands on faculty. So what are some strategies that you use um, uh, so that you can engage in co-production? Uh, yeah, I think one strategy when um, entering a new space and, and wanting to engage in co-production, and I talked I touched on this a little bit in earlier in the talk. Um, for me, it was, for example, coming to Buffalo was really important to learn about the Buffalo community and spend time in building some of those relationships and understand um, the existing relationships in the community. So, and then I think as Allison talked about identifying those shared values and being okay with walking away when those values do not align, that is okay. I think it's worse to try to force um, co-production when it's not fitting. Um, it's better to acknowledge and just be very transparent about that. Um, I'd say those are, are, are two strategies that um, I'm using in my early uh, faculty career. Um, and just really approaching it as building relationships. This is what co-production is at the end of the day. Um, and I think there's a lot of value in just thinking about um, the relationships that I would like to have that a junior faculty would like to have with potential community partners. Thank you, Eli. Um, for Allison, the question is for community partners in any city or region, who wish to work, maybe generally they may not wish to work with universities, but if they wish to work with universities in a way that is beneficial to them or to all parties involved, what are some questions you think about before entering a co-production relationship? What advice would you have for a community organization on what to watch out for, what to think about, what are some questions that cross your mind? So, um, yeah, that's a really good question. So here locally, and um, if anyone was able to listen to uh, Dr. Resnick's initial um, uh, presentation in our series, he gave a really good example about the University of um, Arizona and how they were not transparent with the tribe that they were working with. And um, they, it, it, was, it was a horrible situation. In any case, um, they, a lawsuit was brought, um, the tribe prevailed and vowed to never work with the university again. So bringing that locally, I, like I, like I talked about, I haven't experienced um, you know, any adverse uh, situations working with universities. However, I know they exist because I know what I hear in the community. So, you know, I did bring that up with um, some of the folks in the Masters of Public Health Department and they were great about it. They said, yeah, we know, we know that we have a lot of ground to make up for. And so we don't wanna repeat past mistakes they didn't um, try to sugarcoat it and they didn't try to deny it. So my advice would be, if you know of situations where folks say, no, I'm not working with that university, this is what happened. Um, I would be open about it and say, you know, your, your uh, reputation in the community is, is tarnished because of X, Y, Z. 
And um, how do I know that this experience isn't going to be different? And that answer should be satisfactory to you in a way that you feel like you want to move forward because the project that you're considering is very important for the community or your work. So um, that would be my advice. Do I have some assessment or tool that I use? Absolutely not. Um, but I think asking the questions and evaluating how they're received and the responses is the best that um, most community partners could do. I think I would also add um, from the academic perspective, uh, given, you know, we talked about competing timelines and sort of challenges around that. Um, and, you know, at least I've, I've experienced having moved from different spaces as well, which makes it difficult to establish longer term relationships. And I think that it's important to be, again, just very transparent and communicative about that. But also if you, if one is entering a co-production space, um, having a follow-up plan and plans for next step should a faculty have to step away for whatever reason. Um, that is okay. And that is the respectful way, I think, of handling a co-production relationship. I would agree with that, Eli, um, with regards to the timeline, because if um, uh, community-based organizations can see the objective, the goal, and its impact on the community or, or um, what they're trying to achieve. And if that lines up, that might be um, a good place to start to say, you know what, I do want to take this chance if they feel like they are taking a chance and um, work with this university because our outcomes align. We want the same thing and I can see a clear path and timeline to reaching those goals. Thank you for that. Um, um, there's a comment that I want to follow up um, in the chat, which is from Kristen Tallis, um, who I don't know whether she is in uh, or he is in Buffalo, or I don't know their pronoun either. I don't know where they are, um, but they are uh, acknowledging the paradigm shift away from food deserts and signaling that that is a true representation. Um, so I want to follow up um, to that to share with both Kristen and the broader community in Buffalo that uh, Allison and Eli both made references to the network in Buffalo. And for those who are not familiar with Buffalo, one of the reasons why um, we are lucky is because Eli and Allison both are contributing and participate, participating members of what is called the Buffalo Food Equity Network, which um, does include indigenous representation as well. There's a question from uh, Camille. She's thanking you both and saying that the information is inspiring. Um, she wants to know about power in co-production. A key aspect of co-production involves negotiation of power, interrogating who has power and who doesn't have power in the act of co-producing, asking how can one let go of power and empower. Not everyone comes to the table with the same amount or degree of power or awareness that they have or can change agency. Uh, similarly, not everyone has access to the same knowledge in the same way. Not everyone can access the shared folder, follow schedule, join the Zoom meetings, and understand the value of data. I'm wondering what are some strategies that you have to embrace, uh, that you have to embrace this negotiation of power, particularly in governance, decision-making, and conflict resolution, which involve the negotiation of power. Great question. Thank you, Camille. <laughs> um, Allison, would you like to go or shall I kick us off? <laughs> okay, I'll start. So because it is a very, very um, important question. 
So I think uh, if, if the initial um, relationships or the initial meetings have that feeling where there is um, a hierarchy of power, I think you're probably going to have problems right away. Uh, I think it's just natural that community-based organizations feel like, oh my goodness, the big university. And, and that's not a bad thing. It's just that universities yield power. And um, a lot of times it's, it's, um, it's warranted and sometimes it isn't. So let's just go with this power is warranted and this is a good project. But I think it's incumbent upon the university since they, you know, would yield that power to make the community-based organization and those folks involved understand that there's equal footing with regards to power and your voice is valued and your knowledge. We may have academic power, but you have community power. And if we're going to achieve our objectives, those two levels of power have to be equal. So I would say if you're not getting that initially or the university is not willing to um, operate in that way, that you might have challenges. Yeah, I think uh, to build on that in the research space in terms of thinking about power and the balance of power, I think it's about the culture and the tone that a researcher sets um, with the team. And like I mentioned, um, my first day in my postdoc training, we had a workshop on race and class and what these power dimensions mean in the context of working with community partners. Um, similar to the ways in which community partners um, come to the table with different degrees of experiences and knowledge. It's the same, I think, on the academic side in terms of readiness and experience and working with community organizations. And so I think that a strategy is to create space and opportunities for building capacity among faculty to really, as Allison said, value community voices equally in the same way um, as research is valued. Thank you very much. Um, we have had a fantastic conversation and some great questions. And um, I could not think of a better way to close the conversation on co-production um, than to discuss this power differential and how one might do that. And um, Eli, your comments and also Allison's about the culture and creating a space for that conversation, I think is a reminder, not just for universities, but also the organizations that fund universities like the National Institutes of Health and the National Science Foundation to understand that co-produced research needs to be preceded by that research uh, relationship building that you both are describing. Um, without that, it would be really difficult to co-produce knowledge um, for those kinds of projects that are supported by NIH, National Institute of Food and um, Agriculture and other organizations. Um, we have a lot to digest. Thank you both for your time and really detailing for us um, lessons. And I am excited about continuing to see where your work goes. And we look forward to having you back to perhaps share with us new lessons after you are well into your new project. Thank you both. And thank you everyone for attending. I wanna um, remind folks that this um, talk is video recorded and will be available on our website. And this particular lecture is part of a series that we will continue. We invite you back to the next set and the series will conclude with a conversation about what we learned through the series itself. And we of course welcome you back to that. A link to the series is available in the chat for all of you. 
Um, and thank you for making time in the evening to be here. Be safe um, and be healthy. Uh, goodbye.